but 270 individuals are mentioned 3,780 times with two mistakes. 149 promised land locations are mentioned 670 times with two mistakes. There's over 880 chronological references with one mistake and over 1,600 references to the social geographic groups with no mistakes. I mean, that, that alone is a, a demonstration of memory that transcends, you know, I, you could argue it's superhuman. I mean, yes, there are people who have memorized pi, which is 3.141, whatever, out, you know, umpteen million digits. That's not the same as remembering all of these things in the middle of a real-time dictation. Uh, yeah, I'm impressed. And maybe I need to, to, to not be so, so persuasive in my, my speech here, but I think that's impressive. Mormonism with the MRF, where we do a fair and objective analysis of the church and its truth claims, its history, doctrine, and policy. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel, Mormonism with the MRF, where Larry Saint explores the church's history and the church's truth claims. And I'm really excited for today's episode. I have back with me, uh, friend and scholar, Brian Hales. Brian, thanks for coming back. Hey, it's a privilege. Yeah. So Brian, he was on ooh, back when my channel first started up, uh, I think it was July or August. I had Brian on. We had a really good interview and discussion about Joseph Smith's polygamy. And Brian answered a lot of the, the tough questions, a lot of the controversial things. Uh, and I got, for the most part, a lot of positive feedback uh, on that interview, uh, both believers and, and even critics, even if they didn't agree with all of Brian's answers or conclusions. Uh, they really enjoyed the interview. I don't know if you got any feedback on that one, but it was quite positive for for my yeah. little channel. It was good. Better than you, I thought it'd be. Anyway, you know, you get oh, hammered you. sometimes. So. <laughs> uh, so today, uh, Brian, he's done a lot of work on the Book of Mormon. Uh, so in today's discussion, Brian's going to be presenting sort of uh, his research. And in part one, we're going to be talking about if Joseph Smith had the capability of composing the Book of Mormon. And we're going to be looking at some of the, the theories and the skills he would have needed uh, to produce the Book of Mormon. Uh, for any of my listeners who don't know what the Book of Mormon is, most should be. Uh, but the sort of church's position and what Joe Smith claimed is, you know, the Book of Mormon, it's another testament of Jesus Christ. Uh, it was delivered to him by an angel. Uh, written on ancient gold plates by prophets living in the Americas between 600 BC to 480. Joe Smith claimed that he translated it by the gift and power of God. And it's considered to be sort of like the keystone of our religion, the keystone of our testimonies. And the church sort of rises and falls with the truthfulness and the validity of the Book of Mormon. So it's a huge deal. And it's uh, a part of the church that gets a lot of attack by critics, because if you can disprove the Book of Mormon, then you disprove Joseph Smith uh, and the church crumbles. So I think this will be a really fun, exciting discussion. And Brian, you've prepared uh, some slides for today. I did. I did. And I uh, I forgot one slide that I wanted to put in here. But I, uh, as soon as you're ready, you ready to have me yeah. go at it? Here one thing I slide? just want to note is, um, I think this is Probably a lot of this has come from an article you put in. Um, was it uh, the? I can't remember where it was, but I read it recently. Naturalistic explanation of the origin of the Book of Mormon, and I'll I'll yeah. I'll cite that in the description uh, right. where I think a lot of this information will will come from. And I've also provided it in a PDF handout that you're you're welcome to uh, upload, or I can get you a link if you want. Um, so I'm going to talk about a lot of literary characteristics, and, and that list is reproduced on a handout. The handout's actually been updated many times, and what I, I've given to you is the latest and greatest and, and the one people can get the most out of. So well, This will be really exciting. So yeah, part one is going to be focusing on, on that sort of like the lit literary production of the Book of Mormon. Did Joseph Smith have the skills to compose it? I think you'll be talking about the theories as well for how the Book of Mormon was composed. And then part um, two. That's part two, actually. The that's part two. Okay. Okay. And part two will be responding to, uh, so the theories of how it was composed and maybe some of the critics sort of push back, you know, calling into question, is it a 19th century production? Uh, but I'll let you uh, start us off. Okay. Great. I appreciate it. And the slide that I forgot to add um, was in black and white anyway. 
but all it was was a camera looking at a very beautiful part of Bryce Canyon, but it's blurred. And then the second picture is where it's crisp, uh, it's crystal clear, very crisp. And the thing I wanted to say about that was that uh, I think that scholarship, I think the Book of Mormon is a miracle, but I think the scholarship that we have been able to, to have in the last 10, 20 years, along with the computer, computerized studies, helps us bring into focus this miracle, at least for believers, more than, than at any time in the past. And, and we're going to talk about some, some very minute details about the Book of Mormon. This is the handout I mentioned. Um, it's, it's one that, a, like I say, hopefully you can download from your website. Um, you can email me at josephsmithpolygamy uh, at gmail.com if you want me to send you a copy. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but we all know that Joseph Smith dictated the Book of Mormon, and uh, it was a word stream. If we want to just quickly go re remind ourselves, it was completed in 85 days and possibly as few as 57. The number of words per day were 2,700 to 4,700. The number of words in a dictated block was about 20 to 30, and then it looked like they would stop and check um, spelling. According to eyewitnesses, there was no pre-existing manuscripts or books. There were many onlookers. Some were believers, some were unbelievers, but they were admitted to watch the, the process. Um, Joseph had a seer stone in a hat, and he put it up to his face to occlude the light, and then he, he spoke. After breaks, Joseph would start where he left off. Uh, without reading back, and then multiple scribes, including um, some that didn't believe, were allowed to participate. So as we review this, and uh, we can then go on and say, okay, tell us about the Book of Mormon. This word stream that Joseph produced this way, let's, let's try to understand it. Is, it. is it a simple text? Is it complex? And in what way? And Brian, um, just first, to pause you, have you shared the screen? Because I can't seem to see it. Or are you doing that next? There we go. I apologize. I hit it, but I didn't hit it twice. So let me just back up the, uh, um, um, this is the handout. Yes, that's one I read through. Yeah, and that should be available to anybody who's interested. These are the uh, characteristics I just kind of read off. And now we're to the list, and this is not the same list that's on the handout. The handout has an updated list um, with even some better stuff on it. But we're just going to go through this. I think it's adequate uh, to to identify the fact that that what Joseph Smith did is 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 remarkable in a few ways. Um, the word count is two hundred and sixty nine thousand three hundred and twenty words. Um, that's quite a few words for a book that's that, that's written in less than twelve weeks. I went online and tried to find every book I could that was created in less than twelve weeks. And you can see the uh, the number of words that Joseph produced is really remarkable, um, strictly from a production productivity standpoint. The uh, there's nearly seven thousand sentences, and what's interesting about that is that um, the the sentences are very long. And some people say they're long because he's just rambling, and and maybe there's a few places where that could appear, but most often they're long because there's embedded ideas and phrases that then he has to circle back to the original. And that that really makes it more difficult in my view. But but this is the point of, of I guess, a little controversy. But you can see almost 40 uh, words per sentence is much longer than, than your most of these other books. It reads in an eighth grade level. And, and this is kind of significant. I, they, these are almost all computer uh, assessments. And you can, can fool a computer, but they all agree. There's uh, eighth grade, there's the Lexile, which goes six to 11. Um, but all of these scales put the Book of Mormon at, at least in eighth grade reading level. And I love this quote from Don Bradley, my friend. He said, people have readily assumed the Book of Mormon was within Joseph Smith's writing ability when it's actually questionable how well it was within his reading ability. And we'll come back and talk about Joseph's education here in a few minutes. 
Uh, it's in a dialect called Early English. Um, and, and the point here is that it's not in um, Joseph Smith's uh, vernacular of up, upstate uh, New York. It's actually uh, closely emulates, but not exactly according to Stan Carmack and Royal Skousen. It's very close to the Bible, um, King James version of the Bible. That's the vernacular. Um, there's 5,900, well, there's around 5,900, 5,600 unique words. It just kind of depends how you want to slice it. Is, is ran, run, and running one word or three words? Um, but the take home here is that is not impressive. Um, this, the number of, the, of words in the Book of Mormon, unique words, the vocabulary, um, is not impressive. If Joseph Smith was a super genius, he didn't, he didn't uh, show off uh, that genius by the number of vocabulary words he used when dictating. Uh, there are college level vocabulary words, and, and these are not surprising because the Bible has a lot of those, but there are quite a number that are not in the Bible. And, and this is a busy chart. I apologize. But if you will You're look, okay. here's the words. That are, not, that are in the Book of Mormon. Here's how many times they're used. They're not anywhere in the Bible. And then I've, I've looked at uh, some of the other books that people say Joseph had read, like The Late War and the First Book of Napoleon. We'll talk about those, English Reader, the Arabian Nights, but they're just not there. So where Joseph learned these words, learned how to use them, is really uh, something we cannot currently answer. And that quote from Don Bradley, he said that not only is the book more and above his writing sort of educational capabilities, but he believes also his reading. Well, uh, as, as we'll talk about, uh, even though uh, William Davis says Joseph had up to seven years of education, Joseph really was at about a third grade level of uh, education with the uh, district schooling. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But, but yeah, that's, that's the quote there. Very insightful, I think. Here he's writing at a level that's probably above what he was even uh, trained to read at. Um, there are 107 original proper nouns. These are, are names that he has made up. Here's the list. Um, and there are names of people, places, money, uh, Deseret, things like that. Um, and, and some of these words, like shiblon, 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 shib, shimalon, shim, shimalon, you, you can see you're, you're keen on a certain uh, sound. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, and so people will just say, see, look at this, therefore we've explained how we did it. Well, that really isn't that, e look, that easy or, or that convincing. Look up here. You've got a lot of, of, um, of names that aren't related one to another, Oneida, Auntie, Oraiha, Omner, Ogoth. Um, so anyway, I, I, you would have to spend a little time making up all of these names. I don't uh, know how else to, to conclude these things because they're brand new in the English language. Um, what have you thought of the, oh. the criticism, which I don't think uh, to me is very strong, but it was in the CS letter of similar names and Joseph's sort of surrounding area you know in palmyra new york and um, being similar to maybe some of the names uh in the book of mormon either uh names of like places or maybe names of people um do you have any quick thoughts on that yeah and i have a slide somewhere but i didn't put it in here and we're, we'll come back to the number of places numbers of names of places and, and people in okay a minute. i'm jumping ahead um yeah no it's a good question um but in case I forget to answer it, let me just, just go there now. Those lists of names, I, I think, have about 20 names on it. And what we have in the Book of Mormon, behind, besides 170 proper nouns, there's 207 people and 149 geographic locations. So even if Joseph borrowed 20 or even 40 from his surroundings, he's still got to make up 80% of, of them all. Right. And, and this, this we will see over and over. The critics want to explain away the Book of Mormon by with a little teeny tiny explanation to explain the whole. And we'll come back to that. You'll, you'll see that happening over and over. Um, parallel phraseology, chiasms, alternates. You know, people, th this is a battleground. And I get it. I get it. Um, because people say, see, there's chiasms there. And that means it's an, an, from antiquity. I don't care about that argument. Um, I just 
ask the question, how do you dictate this? I mean, Joseph Smith, this is a first oral draft, and Joseph is putting some pretty complex uh, formatting, and, and this is a good example in Alma 36, 1 through 30. Jack Welch yep. says, this is a big deal. Earl Wonderly says, no, it's not. But the reality is this, it's long. And, and if you break it down into just eight levels, and I know, I think Welch has 12 or 13, but it, on the left, you see the word. On the right, you see the block of, of, of uh, sentences where that word occurs. It doesn't occur anywhere else in any of the other blocks until we get to the flip down here. Same with bondage, trust. And the other interesting thing is Jesus Christ is the middle. And, and my question, I mean, we can, my question is, how do you do that mentally? Um, how, how do you develop that skill? How did Joseph Smith as a 23-year-old farmer learn to do that? And of course, if we look at numbers, here's another six-level chiasm oops, from uh, Mosiah. But over here, just these are the number of levels and then the number that occur. And, and people say you can learn to speak in chiasms and, uh, you know, maybe two and three level chiasms. But when you get these more complex, I just, I, I cannot understand how a, a person, even a genius is able to keep that many words straight, um, like, like we're seeing here. Um, I have, it is, a, it is a beautiful piece of religious literature, Alma 36. And yeah, your point, it is pretty, it's quite incredible that he was able to dictate that um, himself, if it wasn't by, you know, inspiration, the gift of power of God. Well, I, I, I think it demonstrates a skill that, that is unknown among, among humans. I, I don't know of any orator, extemporaneous speaker who, who could do this kind of a thing, even if he were memorizing it, we'll talk about memorization in a minute. I, it's just, a, it's a question mark and I'm, you know, the critics are certainly open to respond. Um, and alternate is, is where you you speak it in the topics in one direction and then speak them in the same direction rather than flipping it like a chiasm. And these are the numbers that are there. Again, this would these appear to be purposeful. So he's doing this mentally before he speaks it. Um, but just moving on, stylometric consistency. Stylometry means different voices in the text. And there's been several articles written about this, but my point is that everybody who reads the Book of Mormon, I think, acknowledges that, that the way Nephi wrote was quite different from the way Mormon wrote. So Joseph's got to switch his brain while he's dictating, if he's using his own intellect, to be able to, to create the types of, of syntax and grammar that are specific to different author voices. Uh, the Bible intertextuality, there are hundreds of phrases and integrations which are, are similar um, to the Bible. And probably the easiest, oh, this is one uh, where in Isaiah is in black. And then you can just see that the dictation from Second Nephi is wrapped around this uh, part here with the red. And uh, Grant Hardy said Joseph Smith wasn't, uh, uh, you can read between the lines, but Joseph Smith was writing between the lines, but he's actually dictating between the lines. Uh, again, how, how can you do this? Well, the answer is that, that Joseph Smith had simply memorized the Bible, um, but there's eyewitnesses who said he didn't know the Bible and didn't really know the Bible very well till he created the JST. In, and finish that work in around 1833. Nick Frederick has an article where he goes through all of this, but there really are hundreds and hundreds of, of similar phraseology that uh, come right out of the KJV. Uh, again, if he didn't have the, the Bible almost memorized, then you got to ask yourself um, what's going on. There are 207 named characters who are mentioned 3,780 times with two mistakes. Um, here are the 207 individuals, uh, names of people. None of them begin with D, F, Q, U, V, W, X, and Y. And, uh, you know, over two-thirds of these are not main players. Some of them, their name appears one single time. And I took out all the Bible names. You know, if, it, if it's just quoting something from the Bible, I, I didn't include that. These are Book of Mormon people. Okay. Um, again, go ahead. No, keep going. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought Chad had a comment. I always like your comments. 
but the, the point is that you kind of have to have a profile for each one of them, at least mentally, to keep track of everybody <laughs> that's in there. Now, uh, some will say, well, just certain small groups are working at one time. That's true, but there are references back. And uh, 207, if we, if we compare that to some of these books, um, it's actually pretty, uh, there's 0.35 new names per page. Um, War and Peace has more. Uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone is, is just a little bit more, but it, it's pretty concentrated. If, if the Book of Mormon only had a couple of dozen characters, it would certainly have been a lot easier, I think, to, to remember what, who's saying what uh, throughout. Social geographic groups, there's 45 of these, and some of them, like Lamanites, are mentioned 700 times, but the Lemuelites are only mentioned five times, and the uh, people of Am and Ihar, two times, Amlicites, or of course, there's some controversy there, but you can just see that, again, these are other complexities he's got to keep straight. I don't know that anybody's identified any mistakes with, with how he remembered uh, these guys, and there's over uh, 1,300 references if you add up all these numbers. Well. Wow. Um, genealogies greater than 20 generations. Uh, there's, of course, the Nephite generations and the Jaredites. But again, one more thing you got to keep straight. And there's no mistakes here in the way the genealogy unfolds here uh, between uh, these two that are in the Book of Mormon. It's really impressive in the, in the Book of Ether because in the first, I think it's verse three, it gives you the first, gives all of these people in order. And then the rest of the chapters just just reverse it and and they're all right right in, in the right order uh, oh, it's quite impressive because i i know i've heard critics say you know when the 116 pages were lost um that joseph couldn't remember all the names for the different kings and that's why when he sort of went back and did you know first and second nephi um that's why he called all the kings you know nephi because he couldn't remember the names but i find that quite impressive as you highlighted that in ether he he was able to uh, memorize and to recite all those names. And like you said, in reverse order, and they might think, oh, maybe he had a peek at the manuscript. Uh, but according to the witnesses, you know, that, that wasn't going on. Exactly. Yeah, eyewitnesses uh, were telling us there were no books or manuscripts. And so he's, he's mem manifesting a lot of, of really good ability to remember here. Um, names for the primary portrait protagonist over a hundred and you just kind of wonder why did he even do this um if again he's doing this of his own ability um the holy one of israel the mighty one of jacob most high god you know you could come up with a dozen or so references for god and everything would have been fine but you you also find and we could go back to the the different voices of of the uh, people who are speaking in the book of mormon they definitely prefer certain ways to refer to god and they will be the only ones to do that. Again, it's a study. I, we won't, I don't have the data in front of me, but, but um, like King Benjamin would use one, one way to refer to it, Nephi another, that, that isn't found anywhere else by, by others that are in the Book of Mormon. Uh, references in the Old World to geography, there's at least 15. And what's interesting, and, and I'm sure you've had people talk about this positively and negatively, or you will, but it describes going south southeast for many years, coming to a place called Nahum, where Ishmael dies, and then they go directly east and they come to the ocean and a very lush area. And what's interesting is if you if you superimpose this on a map of of the the uh, area of Palestine and down in Saudi Arabia, we find not only do the directions line up because there's these wadis which are very lush that that correspond to Bountiful. Uh, quite well. And then, of course, if we go to maps uh, of, of very early maps, and there are people who want to say Joseph saw these maps, but there weren't any in the United States close to him for him to see. But there is this Nahum, which isn't exactly Nahum, but they they just wrote the consonants NHM. And it, so there's when people say there's no archaeological evidence for the Book of Mormon, they're, they're wrong. This is a bullseye hit. Despite all of the uh, criticisms and and the ways it's that people try to dismiss it, the critics, um, this really is a bullseye hit, and no amount of rhetoric, I think, can can undo that reality. So, am I right in thinking there's no uh, vowels in Hebrew? So that's why it right. was just NHM 
inscripted yeah. on the altar. And I believe as well, weren't they, as they were traveling, um, you know, through the Arabian desert, they're naming all these places, but whenever they buried Ishmael, they said it was called Nahum. Um, so it, they, they didn't name it. And that's the inscription that's on uh, like the burial sites, um, which is where they buried Ishmael. It is a, yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, parallel. Um, yeah, so, and, and there's been a lot of ink uh, spilled over this issue, but I, I, I just, I'm so nonplussed by the, uh, the counter arguments there. Um, if we move on, though, to the promised land, somewhere in the Americas, uh, we find there's over 149 geographical locations. Here they are. Now, you'll notice that I've included land of Le ne Lehi Nephi and, and city of Lehi Nephi, um, and these if you take away the city of, land of, uh, forest of, waters of, there's 99. So I don't want people to think I'm artificially inflating it. But when you're talking memory, you, you kind of have to, and you're using these kind of modifiers, it, it just creates one more level of complexity for Joseph to be remembering while he's dictating. Um, yeah. they, they've made up wonderful maps that show that in a three-dimensional uh, model these the relationship to these 149 relate uh, locations is kept very consistent throughout the entire narrative and and consistent with top topographical uh, elements like you know the just the uh, wildernesses and and uh, mountains and lowlands uh, that are mentioned there there are two mistakes uh, that are obvious um, out of the uh, 670 references Okay. You you uh, said the same with the names. There is two mistakes. Is, is, is that King right, Mosiah right. and Benjamin? Yeah, those are the two. Okay. And the other two are just they're they're during the war period and, and mar armies are marching to places that clearly they couldn't be marching to. Um, right. in two out of six hundred and seventy uh, references. Um, there's 2065 ecological references. The ecological land of the promised land is very consistent uh, with what one would expect for, for the strata that's, that's consistent with it. Um, it. It's not like you're, you're describing things that were, wouldn't be in the same geographical location. Um, there's, there's 77 storylines. Oh, let's see, what am I doing here? Um, there's monetary system of 12 distinct values. There's over 180 chronological references. There are three different chronological systems. Um, there's one reference of the 180 that's off by two years, it, it appears. The rest appear accurate. Um, 77 storylines. Um, and here they are. Boom. And some of them are kind of simple, but some of them are pretty complex. You could almost break them into more. But Joseph Smith, as if he's making this up, He's making up a lot of different stories. Um, they, so you, you just wonder how much time it would take to be able to, to make up all of these. Um, there are flashbacks and embedded stories, at least five of these, and we're all familiar with them. Zenith, Noah, Benedict, Limhi are, are, are in, have, have gone to a different place. Waters of Mormon Alma is baptizing there outside of where King Noah is. But he's keeping all of this straight. I mean, there's no contradictions or anything in the timing or locations. Again, just makes it more complex. There's 63 major sermons. Um, and here's, here's the references and the topics. These comprise 80, over 87,000 words um, in the Book of Mormon, which is over a third of the text is religious teachings. Um, this is a summary slide I threw in. The length of the sermons varies from 89 words to 10,000 plus words. Average is around 1,400 words. Um, and there's, there's the, the 87,744 words. I've measured them. I've identified them all. I've charted them. I've thrown them into Excel to, to make all the uh, calculations. So um, I don't know if, if you're going to talk about this uh, later and maybe in part two, but um, I remember whenever I read Grant Palmer's books, um, an insider's view of Mormon origins. And he he was sort of showing some of the parallels or similarities between 
uh, Protestant or Methodist sermons that Joseph may have, have heard as he was, uh, you know, visiting other churches to some of the sermons in the Book of Mormon. Do you have a, a slide on that later or, or do you have any thoughts on that, that it, um, some of the sermons sound almost like Protestant Christianity? Well, I mean, how many ways can you teach religion? <laughs> you know, to, to say that there are some of these 63 sermons are similar to how preachers were preaching in the 19th century is it, not surprising. I mean, there's only so many ways you can teach a religious doctrine. And, and I, I have to tell you that Grant Palmer, having worked with his, his stuff on polygamy, there is no scholar more uh, apt to be wrong and and to to make up data than Grant Palmer. Uh, he's I, he's not the least bit credible for me. He doesn't stick with the uh, documents, and he seems very comfortable just kind of making things up as he goes. At least on polygamy, and I haven't studied what he had to say on Book of Mormon for that reason. Um, but again, I, I some similarities here or there. Again, we're we're finding a few little teeny things and trying to explain this huge thing. How does similarities with 19th century preachers explain where he comes up with 87,000 plus words? I don't think that one follows the other. I don't think the logic is very strong. So that's my response. I don't know if that's very satisfying to you, Stephen, but- um, uh, No, no, that, that's grand. Um, I'll see if my other question to maybe more for part two. I'll let oh, you keep okay. going. All righty, great. Um, there are uh, a couple of things about the sermons, the religious teachings in the Book of Mormon. There's dozens of topics. I had a slide, I took it out, but there's just, you know, dozens and dozens of, of the most important religious topics are covered with complex explanations and discussion. Uh, and what else is interesting is, is multivalency. And this is on the handout. It's not here on the slide. Multivalency means you can read it a second and third time and get new meaning. And I personally have experienced that with lots of parts of the Book of Mormon. I don't even know how a person writes so that that can happen. I don't think if I read the book Tom Sawyer, you know, six or eight times that, that I'm going to get lots of new things on those later readings. Maybe. I haven't tried it, so, so I don't know. But multivalency is, is absolutely a characteristic of the Book of Mormon. Um, that's something that I think a lot of members would agree with you there on their experience as well with reading the text multiple times over the years and um, getting new meaning or new insights and inspiration from it. So there's depth uh, in its text. Well, and, and how do you do that? I mean, we're tr I'm trying to figure out what skills Joseph had as he's doing it. It's like, what kind of a skill allows a person to dictate text He's not even writing it. He's not writing it and rewriting it so he can plug in new nuance. He's speaking it the, the first time and getting it right. So it does that. I, I just, I don't know. Um, you'll, you'll find as we talk about the skills here in a minute, there's some that I just have to put a name on, but nobody's ever heard of them. Um, the formal headings and chapters to books and editorial promises are in the book. Uh, editorial promises are where it says, I'm going to tell you about this in a minute. And then he does. And there's 121 of those. I'm grateful to the people at Book of Mormon Central for uh, coming up with that number. But the headings are important because, and here's what we're talking about. This is a book of Alma. Here's a heading. This was on the plates, or at least Joseph dictated it. In this book, which has been quite popular, Visions in the Searstone, William Davis, who I want to say, um, he is one of my heroes, okay? He is a pioneer. He is the only person, only scholar I know of, who has believed that Joseph Smith's intellect was sufficient to create all the words, and, and this is what makes William Davis different, William's trying to tell us how Joseph did it. He's trying to look into Joseph's head and say, look, here's what he kind of was thinking, and, and here's how it could have been a, a real possibility. The problem is, that he also says that using headings was just a 19th century thing. It's an anachronism. Well, it isn't. Um, this is uh, multiple um, authors used headings. This is Josephus, which originated in the first century AD. And you can see there's headings in the, the text. And then this reprint has additional headings along the side, the reprints from, I think, 600 AD. Um, here is Eusebius, about 400 um, AD, again, with headings. Um, we can go back even even further, but but you just 
the idea of headings is, is pretty intuitive. I don't think you're going to assign that to any century. Um, Aristotle said it's, it's good to use headings, and this is like 400 uh, CE, BCE. Um, yeah, I've, I've not read his book, but I did listen to him being interviewed on a podcast, and I think uh, it was his argument that uh, the little heading at the start was almost like that sort of like Joseph's rough outline, and then he just um, expands upon it right and and you'll notice that yeah i, I mean that what he's saying could explain you know the uh, the headings in the uh, editorial promises but it it really doesn't explain how joseph made up 77 storylines and 207 people that's just all assumed i wrote a very lengthy review of this it was published in the interpreter and if you want to accept the theory in this book you also have to accept a whole bunch of assumptions that are just not the least bit plausible or even humanly possible in, in my in my view. Um, and you can read that if you want. I, you know, Bill, but like I say, I, I like uh, William Davis's uh, attempt, and I hope we'll have many more from the critics, from the skeptics, from the naturalists. Mm. So his is your to... favorite naturalistic go at explaining the Book of Mormon. <laughs> right, right. You know, give us a plausible uh, theory. And of course, the second part, we're going to talk about the eight most popular theories that are out there. Yeah. Um, there's 24 internal historical sources. I've, I've illustrated them here. And the reason that I put this up is this just makes the text more complex for a guy who's just dictating without notes. Uh, this just makes it all the harder to, to keep everything straight. And, and he does. Um, lastly, there are subjects that are discussed with precision. So he'd have to do some research. He wouldn't have learned this in district school, probably wouldn't have learned it from just chatting with his neighbor over the fence in the back. Um, Hall of Tree Husbandry, Dan Vogel dismisses uh, Joseph Smith's version because Romans has 218 words, discussion of olives. Book of Mormon, 3,750. And then Luke has figs and there's grapes here. But just, I mean, it's a much more complex discussion that is actually accurate until it breaks for an inaccuracy to, to allow the analogy to continue. And we readily acknowledge that, um, but he's keeping a, a huge consistency here, suggesting he must have had experience with it, but he didn't. Olives didn't grow in upstate New York. So um, Israelite law is correctly applied in all of these cases. Uh, again, suggesting that he studied the Bible in incredible detail or, or has got some external texts that have helped him understand. Intricacies of warfare, you, you see here, there's just all kinds of, of little things, how to dispose of the dead, treatment of prisoners, the laws of war. Um, so here we are with the, um, the list that we have. And, and again, on the handout, you've got even a more complete list because uh, what's interesting, and this is a study that I just did a few weeks ago, I wanted to see how many times Joseph Smith quoted from the Book of Mormon uh, and how often he would, uh, how, how much more likely he was to quote from the Book of Mormon versus the Bible or vice versa. And I can only find Joseph Smith quoting from the, Bible, from the Book of Mormon on three occasions. He, he quotes two verses that deal with the three witnesses. And then when talking about the location of the Zion, the promise in the promised land, he quotes two verses out of ether. And then on a, on a third occasion, he references um, Alma, where he talks about praying over our, our flocks and herds. And, and those are the only time that Joseph ever quotes the Book of Mormon in his entire life, as far as we have from the databases created of his, his uh, speeches and writings. And, and when you look at all the numbers, though, and compare it to how often he quoted from the Bible, he's, he's at least 20 to 40 times more likely to quote the Bible than the Book of Mormon. Now, the reason I think this is, is really surprising is that if you spent all the time making up these storylines, making up these sermons, for example, he, he mentions the word faith over 100 times in his discourses, but he never once compares faith to a seed. If you read Alma 32, that's kind of one of the more quoted discussions about faith. Yeah. Joseph never never repeats it in his own in his in, own discourses. So that is interesting, yeah, because you're right. Like he's a lot more focused on the Bible 
you know, in his sermons, in his, you know, work on the Joe Smith translation of the Bible after the Book of Mormon is produced, you would think, yeah, he, he if he made this work, he'd want to quote it and sort of publicize it a lot. Well, and, and by referencing it, he, he could he could make it valid. I mean, if it were his creation, he you would imagine maybe he'd say, and here's what, you know, Benjamin said. Benjamin's never quoted. Nephi said, no, Nephi's never quoted. And 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 that scripture, you know, it's scripture. He'd be building it up, but he he dictates the Book of Mormon and then acts like he doesn't really even know what's in it most of the time, and just lets it stand on its own two feet. It's it, it's it's a curious way to to look at it. Um. um the uh, if we want to then identify the skills that were needed to create a text with all of these characteristics. Here are, here's the eight uh, skills, and I just want to kind of briefly mention these. Um, what's going on? Yeah, let's let's talk about these because I the question is to be able to uh, dictate the book, you probably need some pretty good composition skills and oratory skills. And the question is, well, what were Joseph Smith's skills in 1829? Let's let's talk about this. We've identified the skill list. What about his motivation, his self-motivation skills? Well, um, the, the question I have is, if he, he were a super genius, why would you choose such a cumbersome way to get power, money, sex, whatever is motivating him? And it's difficult for me to identify what that would be. Dan Vogel said he was a pious deceiver. But but he's he's deceiving for a reason, and if he's a super genius, you would just imagine maybe he could use his skill set to get money an easier way. But even aside of that, why did he dictate two hundred and seventy thousand words when a book of probably fifty thousand would have been enough? The Quran is only seventy seven thousand words, so why do you need to go? The, the New Testament's one hundred and twenty thousand words. So Joseph is just going on and on and on doing all these things. And, and, and I just don't understand what possibly would have motivated him. Because um, he we, could have dictated a much shorter book um, right, and right. still, you know, claim that he was a prophet translating uh, an ancient record, dictating it. And certainly the longer the book, the, the more complex, the more difficult it is to, to dictate it, the, the easier it is to look like a fraud you know, to make more mistakes in the dictation process. Yeah, excellent, Stephen. I mean, there you just thinking about it, just isolating motivation. It it it's a toughie to to come up with something that that I think is satisfactory. Now, the second one is English language skills. Um, it's written or dictated at an eighth grade level uh, with these college level vocabulary words. And if you you ever had a vocabulary class, you you can read a a, a word multiple times, but it doesn't always mean you know how to use it exactly. But these vocabulary words, these difficult ones are all used correctly. And then you've got the issues about, um, you know, subject, verb, and grammar. And even though some of the grammar is very old, it's it's very consistent. So um, and am I right in thinking, I think I watched, I can't remember if it was a, a podcast or a video on Saints and Scripted, but the, they corrected a lot of the grammar because they thought it didn't sound right, but it was, am I right in thinking some of the grammar was like almost old English sounding grammar? Well, Stan Carmack and Royal Skousen have compared the bad grammar to grammar from the 1600s. And it was, it was accepted grammar then. So they're arguing this, this isn't bad grammar. This is just old grammar. Right. And, right. and which is an interesting thing. And let me just interject that earlier this year, I took a transcript of the 1830 Book of Mormon, and I compared it to a transcript of the 1981 edition, which is what we have today. And the I put it into a, a compare program that I that highlighted every difference. And there are 4,066 changes between those two. And you can say, holy cow, 4,000 plus changes. Joseph really had to make a lot of changes. This, there must have been lots of mistakes that had to be corrected. No, that isn't it. 
Um, if you look more closely, almost 92% of them are single word changes. Again, to upgrade the spelling, about half of them are spelling uh, or to up grade the grammar, there's 227 that are two word changes, 40 that are three word changes. And so all of these are just, again, just trying to make it more understandable, more readable. They're not correcting any mistakes. That leaves 72 changes that go from four to 13 words. And if you look at those, 48 of them are just Joseph Smith crossing out, it came to pass in the 1837 and 1840 printings. And that leaves 24 phrases from, from, 14, from, three, from four to 13 words. And when you look at these changes, I mean, none of them are significant. You could leave the changes unchanged and it wouldn't change anything as far as meaning goes. And so uh, the, and we'll talk about this more in a little bit, but, but Joseph Smith dictated a remarkably refined uh, with respect to, to the language uh, uh, first draft, first oral draft. Um, Joseph's imagination and creativity, we've alluded to this, the, uh, the number of original pronouns, titles for God, number of plots, geographic locations, and the characters, just a lot of creativity was manifested during those three months. Researching skills, um, he would have had to do some research to be able to include some of the data. Um, how he did that, we don't know. Nobody remembers him going to bookstores and libraries. Uh, to research. There's one account of him going in and getting his father's newspaper in 1820, I think it was, and uh, but nobody remembers him coming back and doing extra reading or anything. His mom said he wasn't uh, prone to books. He, he didn't like to read. Story composition skills. Again, we've alluded to, to all of the stories and things that are there. You still got to put all the stories together, but what's important But Joseph Smith dictated a remarkably refined, uh, with respect to, to the language, uh, uh, first draft, first oral draft. Um, Joseph's imagination and creativity, we've alluded to this, the, uh, the number of original pronouns, titles for God, number of plots, geographic locations, and the characters, just a lot of creativity was manifested during those three months. Researching skills. Um, he would have had to do some research to be able to include some of the data. Um, how he did that, we don't know. Nobody remembers him going to bookstores and libraries uh, to research. There's one account of him going in and getting his father's newspaper in 1820, I think it was. And, uh, but nobody remembers him coming back and doing extra reading or anything. His mom said he wasn't uh, prone to books. He, he didn't like to read. Story composition skills, again, we've alluded to, to all of the stories and things that are there. You still got to put all the stories together. But what's important is that, and this, this is a, an important point, that, that William Davis in his article on Joseph Smith's education says that he learned composition in the upstate New York uh, schools in 1820. This is simply inaccurate. It is wrong. Uh, there is, they didn't teach composition. They didn't have paper and, and, and Joseph never wrote an essay or a short story and handed it into his teacher to be corrected. They didn't have paper, they didn't have money for paper. Um, and composition, the first composition textbook in America was published in 1827. And it, it wasn't taught, uh, it was taught in college and secondary schools uh, during the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, but the idea that Joseph is learning composition uh, is simply false. And we, we, we know he had composed two letters and written them, we think. Beyond that, he had no composition experience or training at all. And the same kind right. of goes for, for uh, oh, the, uh, here's, in the interest of time, if somebody wants to, to read these, they can stop the, uh, the podcast. This is just people remembering that Joseph really was, was almost illiterate. He wasn't illiterate. He wasn't stupid. He was intelligent. He could write, but he didn't have the skill set. Because um, yeah, Lucy he says he seemed much less inclined to the pursuit of books than any of the rest of our children. Now, I think later, after you know he becomes a prophet and the church is established, I think he does you know become more interested in reading and uh, becoming more scholarly. And you know he's learning about Hebrew and such, but in in his youth there's 
not really any r records from family members of him reading much. Exactly. Um, there are a couple of people. One said he he would he loved the Arabian Nights and he loved dime novels, um, but but it, it's very limited. Um, and and this is on the handout too, so you can go through those. Um, what's also interesting is that Joseph produced his his most complex and lengthy uh, literary work so young in life, and then we just see a little bit of of, of addition to that. Most writers, it's a crescendo. They start with their shorter, less complex things, and their best stuff comes somewhat later. Um, sermon composition skills. There's uh, Joseph Smith is not known to have well uh, to have given a a sermon prior to the church being organized in 1830. Uh, nobody remembers him going out being a, a storyteller or anything like that. Um, there is, there was one person who remembered Joseph Smith, and we may refer to this again in a minute, but it's Orsimus Turner remembered that Joseph helped with the, uh, debate school and that he also was a passable Methodist exhorter. And people inflate this, these accounts. Um, Will, William Davis in his PhD dissertation mentions Joseph debating, uh, almost a hundred times. And, uh, and in his book, Visions in a Seer, Seerstone, he mentions Methodist exhorting 18 times. The reason that's, that's important is the same individual apparently wasn't very impressed with Joseph because he said that Joseph Smith's intellect was less than ordinary. And, and honestly, neither of those publications tell us that. The quote is, is buried somewhere, but not tied back to the same person uh, who says the person who remembered his exhorting and his debating didn't think he was very smart. So he couldn't have been too impressed with his debating and his exhorting. A kind of an important right. point when we're trying to reconstruct what happened. Do you um, have any thoughts, Brian, on, um, you know, you know, you said that he was involved in, you know, debate society and being a Methodist exhorter at times, um, whether or not he was a good one. But the word um, I exhort you, I think it's in the Book of Mormon um, at certain times. And uh, a critic might say is that, like a 19th century element of Joseph's sort of vocabulary, you know, is that coming into the Book, Book of Mormon? Do you have any thoughts on why, you know, the word exhort is in there? Um, well, I, um, I have to, I don't know that that's one that was on the, uh, that was on the list of, of difficult words, but I'm just pulling up a transcript of the 1830 Book of Mormon and exhort is used 29 times. I don't know that out of 269,000 words, that's all that often. Mm. So, um, yeah, sorry. I think the, the only pastor that comes to mind, I think it was Amulek. Um, because I think Alman Amulek, Amulek was like the member who was like inactive and then he joins uh Alman when they're preaching, and uh, I think he exhorts. I think that's the, the chapter I'm thinking of. Well, and, and again, I, I think if these claims are being made by, by critics, it, it shows us how this one little teeny tiny, um, 29 words out of 270,000, this, this connection is, is then implied to explain the bigger you know, picture. I mean, the English language only has so many ways to say exhort or admonish, and, and we go through and figure out which ones are in the Book of Mormon. Um, but I, I don't, I don't find 29 and 270,000 to really be a, a very much of a hint on how Joseph created all the words personally. I think um, some of it comes also down to how you view his translation. I don't know if you'll talk about this later, but like the tight versus loose translation. And if you hold to more of a loose translation that he's sort of clothing the, you know, the, um, the translation into his own sort of 19th century vocabulary then that, that could be a possible explanation for why the word exhort uh, is in there. Um, maybe that's it. But I would say that I, I'm, I'm not a fan of the loose uh, version. I think Joseph got most of, of the text from the seer stone without him interjecting very much of Joseph Smith. And the reason is, when you look at how complex it is, go back to that list of complexities. 
and and however much of Joseph's intellect, even if you were a genius and he's dictating in real time, he's wordsmithing, he's got to remember the plot, he's got to remember everything that came before and what came immediately before, the, the, anything that's not given to him that he's got to use his own memory for, I mean, that's where problems are going to come from. And and so I I don't know that it was a, a teleprompter, the Searstone. I'm I'm not a fan of that, although that's what everybody thought was happening around him. But yeah, because the think... witnesses talk about that the, the English translation would appear on on the stone. You know that right. there'd be a um you know a hieroglyph. Then the English translation, he was sort of reading it or dictating it, and you know they couldn't move on and, unless it was written correctly. Right. And, and that, uh, anyway, the good news is that all of those accounts have been uh, uh, brought together by Jack Welch, and you can download them, and you can become an expert on, on the, how the translation occurred just by reading this database of, I don't know, 50, 60 pages that was published in a book called Opening the Heavens. Um, but, but here's a good example of what I'm, I'm saying in the memorization, and, and we've talked about some of these numbers, and I mm. don't think I'm overstating what happened. It, these are numbers I, I'm happy to share my data uh, with anybody if they're interested. But, but now let's switch, because these we up to now, the first six skills were to create the text, seven was to remember it. Now we've got these, um, oh, let, let me say one more thing, um, and you mentioned this earlier, um, People will say Joseph had a photographic memory. Uh, there's good reasons to believe he did not. First off, nobody said he ever did. They never implied that he did. They that later on they said Joseph was had a great mind and had good intelligence. Nobody, nobody knew him. And I have a database of almost a hundred references to his intellect, his intelligence, his education, his his uh, cognition. All of it, all of those these people negative, positive, anything referring to that. And it'll be an appendix in the book that's being published on this by Greg Coford Books, hopefully later this year. Um, but there's not a single person who thought Joseph was smart enough to be the author of the book. Nobody is accusing him of that. And we'll talk more about it. But Joseph Smith tried in 1835-36 to learn Hebrew. And they hired Joshua Satius here. And in the upper floor of the Kirtland Temple, they had a school of prophets. But you know who the star student was? Joseph worked really hard. That wasn't Joseph Smith. The star student was Orson Pratt. And he was a genius, but nobody thought he could create a Book of Mormon. Uh, but Joseph, no matter how he, hard he tried, he, he still wasn't a star student. If he had a photographic memory, he could just have memorized the lexicon and, and he would have bested everybody. Just didn't happen. Isn't there also um, um, a story in church history where they were critiquing um this isn't do the book more but some of joseph smith's revelations in the doctrine and covenants and um then they have a go at trying to dictate and produce a revelation and uh i think they failed you know uh they they yes uh, william mcclellan is blamed as the one who tried to do it and failed but i yes i thought it was him yeah there's another up more updated version of that that says really he didn't try that 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 tries to set the the record straight for William that he he really wasn't trying to uh, be prideful and, and duplicate Joseph so but but the Lord did say um, you know go ahead and try to duplicate Joseph's revelations if you think you can and if I could just make a wee comment on ours in the Book of Mormon because some people might be a bit perplexed you know that there would be any mistakes in it you know if it came you know from you know directly through the power of god why would there be even um any errors in it but the book of mormon itself doesn't claim to be inerrant i don't believe like doesn't it say is it in the title page like if there are mistakes you know these are the mistakes of man but condemn not the things of god so it claims to be the most correct book but not perfect yeah and it's a, it's a good point. See, from my perspective, the most remarkable thing Joseph did is found in how refined the message is of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon did not go through a second draft or a revision. Uh, from a content editing it per perspective, it, it was perfect. And from a copy editing, they, they made all these little teeny changes just to make it more understandable. And, and Joseph was, was the vehicle through which it came. So 
you you know, you're it's not going to be perfect unless he's dictating every word. And that's why I don't think that it was a teleprompter. Um, so, and, and the book itself says that there could be some mistakes in that, but you, you'd never find anybody who writes it. I've written three, 500 page books. Nobody sits down and even writes a first draft that doesn't undergo a lot of changes. We'll talk more about that in, in the, uh, in the second half here. Okay. So, um, the uh, extemporaneous speaking skill, since uh, William Davis calls the Book of Mormon dictation the longest uh, oral performance in American history. And I, and I like that. I like that, character, that characterization that um, it's an oral performance. So Joseph is demonstrating extemporaneous speaking skills. But as we've talked about already, nobody ever remembers him giving any speech prior to the church being organized a year later. <clears throat> and so we ask ourselves, where did those skills come from? Yeah, um, here, here we're coming back to uh, the, the quotes, Lucy Mack Smith, Joseph would occasionally give us some of the most amusing recitals that could be imagined. Nobody else remembered these, even other family members or people outside. And then here's the Orsimus Turner, uh, who talked about the debating club and the Methodist exhorter, but he wrote that Joseph possessed less than ordinary intellect. And Bushman saying he had no reputation as a preacher. So, again, he's demonstrating a high level of extemporaneous speaking without any apparent uh, knowledge or experience uh, training in that. Um, sorry, you could have been reading along with me while I was doing that. Oh, you're okay. And, and that quote by by Lucy Mack Smith in her history, a lot of critics jump on that that Joseph Smith he was telling his family. You know stories about you know the inhabitants you know of the Americas of you know Native Americans and you know their you know their civilization and you know the animals they had and you know buildings and so forth and and they would say that from you know eighteen twenty three when he was uh, telling his family about the visitation of the angel that this was maybe when he was um, sort of practicing his stories and thinking about all these things and so really for six years before. The dictation he was he had all these stories and things uh in his head uh what what do you think think about that well again it's explaining a very very large thing by a very very small thing um i mean he's telling stories how many storytellers in you know teenagers do you know that that you wouldn't expect later to dictate a book of mormon and just being able to come up with 77 storylines or 20 storylines or whatever, it's just one of the many characteristics. You've got all of the other things that the Book of Mormon has, the memorization, motivation, um, and then the oral uh, abilities we're talking about right now. Again, none of these are going to come from just telling your family, occasionally, she said, uh, stories about that. And again, it, it, it's, it's, you know, Hugh Nibley gives the example of, of how critics will effectually say show me how to draw a circle and i will make you a very fine swiss watch you know that that you 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 don't get there the logic isn't making the jump um because there's so much more complexity involved with with what uh, happened right so and what's your take on that do you think he's um telling these sorts of stories you know occasionally because he's maybe from his interactions with the angel moroni or um like what are your thoughts on why he's sort of sharing uh, some of these stories um good question and my my response is that he's either being told by the angel moroni or he's receiving other insights um into it he's obviously meeting with with the angel once a year and and the other um he may be having additional communications uh, maybe he's making it up. Maybe he does have a good imagination and that could explain away one or two of the characteristics, but it doesn't get us all the way. And, and what's interesting is that nobody else remembered it. I mean, if Joseph were always doing that, they'd probably bring in the neighbors and he'd be a, a village storyteller. And, and there's just nobody remembering that. And keep in mind when the Book of Mormon came out, the, the people closest to Joseph, the critics, they were desperate to find an, a good way to explain it. And nobody is saying, oh, I remember Joseph was practicing talks or Joseph was at the 
the bookstore reading or or that he, I remember he had a pile of papers over, at, you know, that he seemed to be working on. Nobody's remembering any of this. And you can bet that if there was any hint, his the the antagonists and they were all around him would have happily exploded some little event into mm. a huge explanation for where the book came from. Um, and we'll talk about that more in the second one. I so, suppose you, you would think his family as well, if he was telling uh, similar stories and then the same stories show up in the Book of Mormon, you might think, you know, you would think they might think like, hold on, this is just the same stories that you were telling us that show up in your Book of Mormon. Right, right. And and there actually are some similarities in dreams and all, but uh, uh, and yeah. you could say they were they were plagiarized by Joseph. But again, that would give you you know maybe five hundred words out of eighty seven thousand of religious teachings. A little bit of something is trying to explain a lot of something in the Book of Mormon, and it, it just doesn't get you there. Joseph is still having to fabricate all kinds of things, even if the the dreams are the same. You add up all of that amount of contribution. Uh, to what Joseph was doing, and it isn't doesn't get you there. He's still got to make things up. He's still got to have these skills. And, uh, that's uh, in reference to Lehi's dream of the tree of life, isn't it? And Joe Smith yeah. Sr.'s dream that it, didn't Lucy Mack, she wrote that in her history. And yeah, it had like, um, what was it? Like a, a, a rope that led to the tree and there was, you know, something similar to great and spacious building. So yeah, you could see that why a critic would believe that Joe Smith was just, borrowing or or taking from uh his own father's stream and incorporating that into the into the text yeah yeah uh, uh, an explanation of a very little part is then extrapolated to the whole thing and that's where i think the the logic breaks down um oratorical formatting i alluded to this earlier it's like how does somebody um format a chiasm when they're talking i how does somebody remember the voice of the author that is speaking? Um, the uh, anyway, multiple those are the personality good disorder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have, have we'll you talk about that splits? in a second. Yeah. <laughs> uh, mental illness is actually advocated as is a way that Joseph did this. We'll talk about that in the second half. The last one here. I've already talked a lot about it, mental redrafting skills. This is the ability to mentally create second draft, third draft, fourth draft. So the, the words he speaks are the final draft. First oral draft is the final draft. And even though it needed copy editing, the, uh, the amount of changes in the message and in the meaning are essentially zero. I know there are four things that people say changed meaning. You got Mosiah and, and Benjamin to me, that's, just not a real big deal. And, and Royal Skousen and Don Bradley say it may not have even been needed, have been needed to do. There's pure and white, the words are switched. Um, there's a couple of places where he adds um, son of to, to try to clarify that while Christ is God, he's also the son of God. And then there's the fourth one is just where a comma is replaced with, or a, a word is replaced with a comma, because it sounds like Christ is the son of the only begotten when it, in fact, it should be Christ, the only begotten. And so mm. they, they've made those four changes. Those are really the, the, the primary doctrinal changes that are made by accusation. And I'd argue they're all just clarifications from a message standpoint, really the original word stream was, was remarkably, if not perfectly uh, uh, dictated as far as meaning. And I think that's, that's the most remarkable thing Joseph ever did. Um, this is, a, I pulled this off the internet. I, I just love it. If you look on the left-hand side, how aspiring authors think novel writing works. You get that first draft and then you do a little bit of editing and then, you know, after you've been inspired. But the real way it works is you get that first draft and then you edit and you edit and you edit and you edit and you come to hate your editor and you come to hate the project and <laughs> it just goes on and on and on. That's you can buy past experience. Yeah, yeah, I've been there. I'll, I'm, I shouldn't say you hate your editors because I've worked with excellent editors. I'm so grateful. Um, I'm working with Lloyd Erickson down at Greg Cooper Books on this one. And Lloyd's great. He edited my third polygamy book uh, back in 2012. So um, I'm excited to see that project go forward with him. But they're just, but you get, it's a dance. Sometimes it's a wrestling match or a fight. Um, and, and yet Joseph skipped that stage. If you look at the second uh, pie chart there, that white area is something Joseph completely skipped. His first oral draft was the final draft. 
So in closing, um, we will, uh, I, I, I conclude that Joseph Smith didn't have very many skills. So there's a gap here. Um, and then I, I love this quote. I, I don't know if the audio will come through. Tell me if it's going to come through here. Be quiet. Could you hear that? Sorry. I no, not, not, not too well. No. Okay. Well, what, what he was saying was that the critics just avoid the question of, of where did all the words come from? And, and his, and uh, Garrett Dirkmott is who that was, is just saying they do that because they really don't have a good theory. And I'm just introducing this chart because this is, is uh, also on the handout, but this is the topic of the next uh, set of discussions um, that we'll be going through. So we can stop right there, Stephen, if you want. Yeah, no, no, thanks so much. This has been a really good, I think, part one, you know, talking about the, the composition uh, skills that Joseph would have needed to produce the Book of Mormon, the literary sort of complexity in there. And a lot of that was, it's kind of, when you have a big list of all of those things, it's there's a lot in there that you sometimes don't, you, you can take for granted uh, as you read the Book of Mormon. So I think this is information overload for probably a lot of my listeners. So we'll probably, we'll stop there for part sorry. one. It, it's been great though it's it's been uh great to just you know all the research that you've uh put into this um so part two will be diving into more like the theories uh for how the book more was composed maybe responding to some of the the critical arguments uh but uh if you've enjoyed this video everyone please uh give it a like uh share and subscribe to my channel and i'll put the links in where you can uh read the articles that brian has written and access the resources as well. And we'll see you on the next episode on Mormonism with the Worth. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks everyone for watching this video. If you've enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up, like, share, comment, and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any future content. You can listen to my episodes on podcast form on Anchor or Spotify, and you can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you care to donate, you can buy on my PayPal or Patreon. Thanks for joining Mormonism with the Murph. Take care. Bye-bye.